effective boards, composition and structure. The Board of Directors is the highest decision-making body after the shareholders' assembly. Therefore, it is important that the skills and experience of board members are appropriate to the requirements of the business. The key issues to consider are board size. There is no single optimal board size as the correct board size depends upon the circumstances of the company. A typical range of board size would be from 5 to 10 members. Excessively small boards have insufficient manpower and skills. Excessively large boards have cumbersome decision-making processes and may lead to some directors seldom making contributions and therefore being non-effective. Skill requirements. Boards require different skill sets, experience, perspectives and personalities to properly fulfill their roles. Every effort should be made to staff the board with skilled and experienced directors. The board must monitor the skills that it needs, identify gaps, and put in place an active search for the right skills and experience. Such an analysis and search should be done regularly and systematically. Independent directors are characterized as being independent of character and judgment and have no material relationship with the company beyond their directorships. For closely held and family-owned businesses, this means directors who are not just family members. For state-owned enterprises, ideally there should be no or only a small minority of government officials on the board. Ideally, the board should be comprised of a majority of independent directors. Where it is not possible, the board should be able to demonstrate, in appearance and in fact, that its decision-making is unfettered, unbiased and free of conflict, personal or otherwise. The board should establish a definition of independence that takes into account the specific circumstances of the company. Non-executive directors a non-executive director does not have an executive operational position in the company and may or may not be independent. Non-executive directors can contribute greater impartiality in their judgments. In best practice boards, the chairperson is usually a non-executive director. Director Selection The board appointment process should be designed to find qualified individuals. Formal written processes ensure that the board member selection yields qualified individuals. The process should be based exclusively upon merit and followed in practice. A good selection process means the company is able to attract the best possible talent to its board. And finally, board evaluation. An effective board should regularly review its composition. Boards should conduct an assessment of their strengths and weaknesses, identify their needs, and devise a board improvement plan to fill gaps as board seats become available. Optimum Board Size The board size should facilitate its ability to engage in productive constructive decision-making, make timely rational decisions, and effectively organize the board's work, including the avoidance of possible conflicts of interest. An optimal board size should be defined by the board in response to the needs of the company and the board. Small boards of up to six members are better suited for closely held and family enterprises. Skills Requirements Boards will require different skill sets, experience, perspectives and personalities to properly fulfill their roles. Board composition should be adapted over time to the evolving needs of the company. The aim is to maintain an appropriate balance of skills and experience, executive, non-executive directors and independent directors on the board. Owners and the board must make an effort to staff the board with skilled and experienced directors. The board must monitor the skills that it needs, identify gaps and put in place an active search for the right skills and experience. Director skills, experience and attributes for consideration. Financial expertise, including finance, accounting and audit procedures. Relevant industry experience, legal expertise, representatives of key stakeholders, 
international experience if applicable, honesty and integrity, gender distribution, and age and tenure distribution. The board should be comprised of a sufficient number of independent directors so that no individual or small group of individuals can dominate the board's decision-making process. An independent director has no material relationship with the company beyond their directorship. An independent director is, therefore, characterized as being independent in character and judgment. There should be no relationships or circumstances that could affect or may appear to affect the director's independent judgment. Although independent director definitions vary among countries, some guidelines boards can use to determine director independence relative to relationships or circumstances that may influence a director's judgment may include former employment with a company, has or has had a material business relationship with the company either directly or as a partner, share owner, director or senior employee of a body that has such a relationship with the company, has received or receives additional remuneration from the company apart from a director's fee, participates in the company's share option or a performance-related pay scheme, or is a member of the company's pension scheme, has close family ties with any of the company's advisors, directors or senior employees holds cross-directorships or has significant links with other directors through involvement in other companies or bodies, represents a significant shareholder, or has served on the board for more than nine years. One of the strictest definitions is used in the UK, UK Combined Code 2006, page 46. The code recommends that the boards for large listed companies have a majority of independent directors. It is the board's responsibility to determine whether the director is independent or not. The purpose of this identification is to ensure that the board includes individuals who can effectively exercise impartial judgment for the exclusive benefit of the company and its shareholders. Their judgment should not be clouded by personal interest, loyalties, or conflicts of interest. Independent directors are best able to assess situations openly and bring an objective, unbiased view to discussions without the fear of possible retribution. Independence is, of course, insufficient on its own. A good independent director will bring a questioning mind, the courage to challenge the positions of executives and other board members, and the relevant expertise and experience. The need for independence must be tempered by two concerns. One, the availability of qualified independent directors is often very limited. While it is essential to have independent directors, it is better to err on the side of quality rather than quantity. A majority of independent directors may be the goal, but a company should not appoint independent directors at any cost. Companies should conduct a broad search for independent directors as soon as possible, particularly given that the essential board committees, audit, nomination and remuneration, have a corporate governance best practice requirement of independence for members, at least at the chairman level. Secondly, Inflexible application of best practice with respect to independence can result in the company losing or failing to take advantage of director talent. Simply conforming to independence requirements is not equivalent to being a good director. As a consequence, failure to meet one of the independence requirements should not disqualify an individual from consideration for a board position. This is especially true where a non-executive director is capable of independent judgment. From a rules perspective, this director may not qualify as being independent, but is often a good practical choice, one that can easily be justified to share owners. The board should include a balance of executive and non-executive directors so that no individual or small group of individuals can dominate decision-making. Non-executive directors contribute greater impartiality in their judgments. They can provide the board with additional external experience and knowledge and may have useful contacts that can be used for the company's benefit.
executive directors. They hold an operational position. Typically, the CEO, the Chief Operating Officer, COO, and or the Chief Financial Officer, CFO. They are best informed about the company's business and its challenges since they make decisions daily about the company's operations and they are ultimately responsible too for the company's operating results. Non-executive directors. They do not hold an executive position and they may or may not be independent. They should constructively contribute to and challenge strategy. They should scrutinize management's performance in meeting agreed-upon goals and objectives and monitor performance reporting. They should satisfy themselves that financial information is accurate and that financial controls and risk management systems are effective. They should assume responsibility for determining appropriate levels of remuneration for executive directors and they should have a prime role in appointing and, when necessary, removing senior management and then leading succession planning. In these roles, strong interpersonal skills are important. Individuals who demonstrate these characteristics will be hard to find. This combination of characteristics and skills are typically found only in those individuals with considerable business and board experience. Board members should be appointed based upon qualities that they bring to the board and the company to help them achieve company goals. Qualities can be technical, such as financial skills, industry knowledge, legal expertise or marketing expertise, but can also be soft skills like leadership and motivation for serving. The selection and appointment process. The board appointment process should be designed to find qualified individuals. Formal written processes ensure that the board member selection yields qualified individuals. The process should be based exclusively upon merit and followed in practice. A good selection process means the company is able to attract the best possible talent to its board. A best practice approach would typically involve identification of board capability gap, identification of the knowledge, competencies and expertise the board lacks. Develop person specification, that is, identify knowledge, skills and personal attributes that a person needs to close the gap. Develop a search plan. Interview candidates. Select best qualified candidate and recommend for election or appointment and election or formal appointment process. Considerations for individual director's assessment include knowledge, which could be governance, finance, strategy. Competence including critical thinking and analysis, decision-making, interpersonal skills and communication skills. And finally, behaviors or attributes. These include commitment, motivation, responsibility, respect, honesty, integrity, and independence. Board Evaluation an effective board should regularly review its composition. Boards should conduct an assessment of their strengths and weaknesses, identify their needs, and devise a board improvement plan to fill gaps as board seats become available. Board evaluation is discussed in further detail in the subsequent slides. Some activities of the board require specialized knowledge and may be delegated to committees that may be permanent or temporary, also known as ad hoc. Board committees facilitate the effective handling of a greater number of issues by allowing experts to focus on specific areas and provide recommendations to the board, as well as the avoidance of possible conflicts of interest. These committees allow for subject-specific expertise on the company's operations and enhance the objectivity and independence of the board's judgment. It is important to recognize that committees are an aid to the board and not a substitute for board decision making. They do their work separately and present their findings for consideration by the board. International best practice suggests that the key committees every board should have include the Audit Committee, the Remuneration or Compensation Committee and the Nominations or Governance Committee. 
Of all the committees of the board, the Audit Committee is the most important, as it has the responsibility for overseeing the control and reporting environment of the company. The Audit Committee is not a legal requirement, but for state-owned enterprises and listed companies, it is a regulatory requirement. And for closely held companies, risk oversight is implicitly required. The role improves or recommends the approval of the appointment of external auditors, monitors the overall relationship with the external auditor and external audit activities, oversees the company's internal audit and internal control activities, reviews and reports to the board the most critical accounting policies, which are the basis for financial reports, monitors and ensures systems reliability, the committee focuses on the process used in preparing accounts and the validity of the accounting methods rather than actually preparing or going into the accounts details which fall under the management's responsibility. Reviews arrangements for compliance with the requirements of regulators. Receives reports on the operation of the company's whistleblower arrangements and may review the company's risk management framework. The committee's composition. Ideally, audit committee members are non-executive independent directors. The minimum number of members is usually three for large listed companies and two members on smaller listed and large unlisted companies. For SOEs, a minimum of two non-executive members must be appointed to the audit committee and the CEO, CFO and internal auditor can be invited to attend some parts of this committee's meetings. All relations with the external auditor are handled by the audit committee. The external auditor reports to the board and the General Assembly through this committee. The Remuneration and Compensation Committee considers matters relating to board and executive remuneration, approves changes to incentive and benefits plans applicable to senior managers, and may be involved in remuneration decisions for the entire company. Their composition, all independent non-executive directors. The Corporate Governance and Nomination Committee considers matters relating to corporate governance, including the composition of the board and the appointment of new directors. It oversees the annual performance evaluation of the board, its committees and the individual directors. It also reviews strategic human resource decisions and succession plans for the chairman and other key board and executive positions. Its composition all independent non-executive directors. The committee's work is often supported by outside search consultants.